Good morning, everybody. Try that again. The first hymn this morning is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Da, 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 da. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain. I count but loss and for contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me. I sacrifice them through his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow So rich a were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. My soul, my life, my all. Good morning, and welcome to worship as we again gather in spirit, though not in person. We continue in this time of serious disruption of our freedom, our activities, and our schedules. Many feel the pain of isolation. Some feel severe financial strain already, and there is a sense of anxiety as we await the future impacts this epidemic will have on us, our loved ones, and our community. And to emphasize the darkness, our scripture for today is on the crucifixion of Jesus. It is at times like this that we are invited, and in some cases forced, to give up what we thought was crucial in our lives, and we are invited to consider what we can let go of and what can be reimagined. May God's peace move into those holes of emptiness or loss, even as we continue in this challenging time. May we be encouraged by Jesus on this journey of faith and trust and love for all as we together worship the God of life and love. Please pray with me. God, who understands deeply what is going on in our world and in each of our lives and hearts today, bless us with your presence and strength. In the words of one of our hymns, shepherd us, O God, beyond our wants, beyond our fears, from death into life. Through Jesus, our Savior and God, Amen. Please join with me in the call to worship. Source of all hope and peace, we gather this morning to be church. We are distant from each other, but not from your loving presence. Bless each of us wherever we are that we may choose justice by your spirit. Draw kindness from the well of mercy and walk humbly in your path, O oh God. We trust in you, O oh Lord, our home and our provider. Amen. And now please join in him, uh, Christ be near at either hand, led by Matt Yoder. Please join me in singing number 80 in Sing the Journey, Christ be near at either hand. 
Christ been here at either hand, Christ behind, before me stand, Christ with me wherever I go, Christ around above, within my soul enshrined, Christ control my wayward heart, Christ abide and never depart. Christ my life and only way, Christ my lantern night and day, changing friend, guide and shepherd to the end. Please join us in the confession and assurance. The Lord proclaims, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I the Lord have spoken and will act. God, you called us to life in the spirit, yet we seek to satisfy ourselves. Though we call you gracious, we practice greed. We praise you with our lips, but do not honor you with our lives. Discontent consumes us as we yearn for still more things. Yet we know that to live in, your prom in you promises the inheritance of new life. Merciful God, we return to you. Our souls wait for you more than those who watch for morning. In you there is steadfast love and great power to redeem. You are the way and the truth and the life. Restore us and free us for joyful obedience. Amen. Okay. Hi! It's me, back for the children's message, and Earl back as well, because I know everyone likes to see him last time. So today, first, before we get started, I want to remind everybody that um, our children's offering this quarter is set to go to the Randolph Street, uh, okay, <laughs> the Randolph Street uh, Gardens, and since we're not all together, we decided that a good way for us to keep giving to the Randolph Street Gardens, which grows lots of food for people who need food, especially right now, is for all of us in our home to grab a basket or maybe a, an empty flower pot or a little box or anything you have, or maybe even your piggy bank. And every week we'll put a little um, our offering in there and then when we all come back together we can bring our baskets to church and we can dump it all in to the basket and give it all to the Randolph Street Garden at one time. Sound good? Cool. Okay, so there's that. Um, so today we are in church. We're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, which is a sad thing to talk about sometimes, but it's also something that reminds us about Jesus's life and the life that he lived and what he taught us about while he was here. So today I am going to, first I'm going to show you how to do a little project um, that you can all do at home. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that Jesus taught us while he was alive. So I'm gonna have my assistant, Doug, hold the camera. So we're gonna figure this out, hold on. Okay, all right, cool. So <laughs> I have made some paper hearts here, here we go. I made some paper hearts. I'm gonna show you real quick how to make one if you don't know. So, you just take a piece of paper, if you have colored construction paper that works, 
or newspaper or just a piece of, of plain paper and you can fold it in half. And when I was your age, I learned that this was called folding it like a hamburger. Um, so maybe that resonates with you. But <laughs> um, so you fold it in half like this and then you find the end that has the fold in it. So the end that's still connected. And on that, I'm gonna draw half of a heart. So you might need your grown up to do this for you. Luckily, I am a grown up, so I have figured this part out. So I'm gonna draw a half of a heart, just like that. See, here we go. And then, like if Doug says it looks like a fishing hook, it does. So we're gonna cut it, oops, we're gonna cut it like this. Make sure you're cutting both sides of the paper. All right, here we go, here we go. Boom, okay. And then you open it up and ah, it's a whole entire heart. How crazy is that? Okay, so I've colored these ones, uh, sort of. Um, you can color them at home. You can use your markers or you can use crayons or you can use paint if you have some adventurous parents. Um, but uh, what we're gonna do before I color this one is we're gonna talk about some of the things that Jesus taught us when he was here on earth. Um, so, um, Earl, because like I said, we're not together. Earl has studied the brains of children to know what you guys would say. Um, and so I'm going to ask Earl what he thinks Jesus taught us when he was here. So, Earl, what is something that, hold on, here we go. What's something that Jesus taught us about when he was here on earth. Earl says he taught us to be joyful. So I'm gonna take my marker and I'm gonna write, actually I'm gonna do it on one of the ones I've colored already. Wait, let me use black. Okay, so I'm gonna write joy. See, joy, it's backwards for you, but just trust me. Um, and then what else, what else did Jesus teach us about? Oh, he taught us about caring for each other and taking care of one another. Oh, Earl's gone. So I'm gonna write care on this one. And then we'll do one more. Um, Earl, down here. Oh, there he is. Earl, what is one more thing that Jesus taught us about? Earl says love. He taught us how to love one another. Good job, Earl. Okay. So I'm gonna write love on this one. And now comes the fun part. So some of you might have already done this, but um, if you haven't, now you can. So I'm gonna take my hearts, and since we're all kind of stuck at home right now, I want to spread this love and joy and care and peace and justice out into the world. So. Doug, my handy cameraman is gonna follow me again. Hold on, I gotta get up. Oh, geez. Okay, <laughs> and we're gonna go to the window and we're gonna tape these to the window. Okay. All right, there we go. I'm still here, I'm just dark, but you can see. So I want this to face outside so that people can see it. So I'm gonna put the, this here and I'm gonna stick it to the window. So now people can see it. And I'm gonna do it again. Oopsie. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna stick it to the window here. Uh-oh, I put it on the wrong side. Oh gosh. Okay, we'll just check that one later. <laughs> um, here's that. And then I have one more. Okay, so, <laughs> thank you assistant. So, um, I'm going to put more on the window so that people walking by can see all of the hearts and spreading the love and joy and peace and care. Um, and uh, you guys can do it too at home. So if you do it, go ahead and maybe have your parents email me pictures or send pictures to the church and we can all share them. That would be really fun. Um, okay, so we're going to have a little prayer. So let me hold Earl's little paw for our prayer. Okay. 
Dear Jesus, thank you so much for living and telling us and showing us what it means to live like you. And thank you for, um, for continuing to teach us that today. We love you. Amen. Bye, guys. I'll be reading from Matthew 27, 32 through 66. As they were going out, they found Simon, a man from Cyrene. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means skull place, they gave Jesus wine mixed with vinegar to drink. But after tasting it, he didn't want to drink it. After they crucified him, they divided up his clothes among them by drawing lots. They sat there guarding him. They placed above his head the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. They crucified him with two outlaws, one on his right side and one on his left. Those who were walking by <clears throat> insulted Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, so you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself if you're God's son. Come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the legal experts and the elders, were making fun of him, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel, so let him come down from the cross now. Then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, so let God deliver him now if he wants to. He said, I'm God's son. The outlaws who were crucified with him insulted him in the same way. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At about three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, he's calling Elijah. One of them ran over, took a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest of them said, let's see if Elijah will come and save him. Again, Jesus cried out with a loud shout. Then he died. Look, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they came out of their graves and went into the holy city where they appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had happened, they were filled with awe and said, this was certainly God's son. Many women were watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to serve him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. That evening, a man named Joseph came. He was a rich man from Arimathea who had become a disciple of Jesus. He came to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission to take it. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had carved out of the rock. After he rolled a large stone at the door of the tomb, he went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary was there, were there sitting in front of the tomb. The next day, which was the day after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. They said, sir, we remember that while that deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days, I will arise. Therefore, order the grave to be sealed until the third day. Otherwise the disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people, He's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate replied, you have soldiers for guard duty. Go and make it as secure as you know how. Then they went and secured the tomb by sealing the stone and posting the guard. Hi, it's me again. Um, I'm doing the drama today that Doug wrote. Uh, it's called, And There We Waited.
I was there the whole time, not just at the end. I was there to witness his ministry. I saw the miracles. I heard his words. I experienced his divinity, his majesty, his... It wasn't just Jesus and the 12 disciples. It wasn't some boy band supergroup. There were a bunch of people following Jesus, and many of us were women. A quick Google search tells me that some Christians aren't comfortable with the notion that Jesus traveled with women. I don't care. Read Matthew 8 and see for yourself. My husband died about a year before I heard Jesus speak the first time. I was vulnerable. The world told me I was worthless. Jesus told me I was valuable. You can be cynical and call me a groupie if you want. I won't stop you from being dismissive. Jesus didn't dismiss me. It wasn't some infatuation with the hot new rabbi of the day. Jesus was more than the bad boy of the biblical scholars. He was the son of God. He was the Messiah. He came to redeem a broken, worthless world. He came to redeem me. And he came to redeem you. I wholeheartedly believe that. I continued to believe that when the, I continued to believe that when the guards flogged him. I continued to believe it when they jammed that thorny crown onto his scalp. And when they got a bystander to carry his cross because he was too weak. And when they finally nailed him to the cross. And when they made fun of him with the King of the Jews sign. And when he finally passed away. Crucifixion is really grotesque. It's a public execution reserved for criminals aimed at maximizing the criminal's pain and deterring onlookers from committing the same crime. I won't revel in the details because I don't want to glorify the manner in which my savior died. But after Jesus died, supernatural stuff started happening all around us. The sky had been dark for hours, even though it was the middle of the day. Then, an enormous earthquake ravaged Jerusalem. The curtain dividing the inner and outer rooms of the temple split in half, and the tombs opened up and dead people walked into town. The events following Jesus' death were the inspiration for zombie movies nearly 2,000 years later. Jesus' death was supposed to be a warning to onlookers not to follow his example, but the events that followed Jesus' death seemed to act as a warning to onlookers not to follow the example of Jesus' accusers. I heard Jesus' last words. I saw them take his body down. I watched them wrap his body up, and I followed them as they took him to the tomb. I'm so grateful that guy from Arimathea talked Pilate into letting him take Jesus' body because if he didn't, I don't know if Jesus would have gotten a burial at all, much less one befitting the Son of God. I saw them roll the stone over the tomb's entrance because they were afraid one of us would steal the body and claim he had risen. I saw the I saw the station I saw them station guards in front of the tomb for the same reason. You could tell they were the Sanhedrin's guards because of how they dressed. They were just as afraid of Jesus' posthumous influence as they were of his teachings while he was still living. And there we waited. I don't know if I really expected Jesus to rise from the dead. I don't know if I watched the tomb because I expected to see the stone roll away. I don't think I expected to see Jesus walked out, wrapped up like a mummy played by Boris Karloff. But I do know, that Je but I do know Jesus and he's, said he would rise on the third day. I believed Jesus was the son of God and I chose to follow him. I chose to follow him. I, I choose to follow him. So I waited. Hello, good morning. How strange it feels that uh, you can see me but I can't see you. And yet, it's good to know that you're there. It's also a little strange to wake up on Sunday morning and think, I probably don't need to shower today. The uh, late night comedy hosts have been doing their shows from their own homes, and that's meant they've had to get a little creative. So Jimmy Kimmel did a Skype call interview with the actor Will Arnett of Arrested Development fame. Arnett was broadcasting from his garage, and he was sort of pretending to do his daily workout, daily workout routine. 
But the best part of the bit was that he had his own laugh track. So, you know, that little machine that plays a recording of uh, an audio recording of studio laughter when you push a button. So Arnett would make a joke, usually not that funny, and then lean over and push the button to drive home the point. The studio audience recording would laugh. So I got the idea for an amen track, you know, for when the sermon reaches the height of its insight and power, but there's no one here to acknowledge it. So I went back through all the old sermon recordings I could find, and I found all the amens and the hallelujahs that were coming from people probably named Tammy and Scott and Tom and Janet. And we're going to try it out today. So I'm going to do a quick test run. Are you ready? Okay, here it is. Sorry. Stephen Colbert did uh, an entire show from his bathtub, so just be thankful that I didn't go in that direction. Little note about this strange distance that we have these days. You're at home, and that means that you can find ways to move. You can uh, be watching this service anywhere you'd like. You can light a candle or set up an image to help you focus. You can color or doodle or knit, which you do anyway. You can drink your coffee, you can eat your eggs, you can even talk back at your computer screen when I say something dumb. Please do all of these things. Let's say a prayer together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was Anne Lamott who wrote the words, I don't have the right personality for Good Friday, for the crucifixion. I'd like to skip ahead to the resurrection. Actually, she says, I'd like to skip ahead to the vision of resurrection of one of the kids in our Sunday school who drew a picture of the Easter bunny outside the open tomb. Everlasting life and a box full of chocolates. Now you're talking. Waiting, like we do in Lent, is not something that comes naturally to most of us. Life right now feels like this strange kind of vigil. Set up shop at home and wait. Light a candle, a flame flickering for the changed and changing world, for the grief of lost opportunities, for the hope that a worldwide pandemic will flatten before the worst. So our example for waiting today is the women in this story, one of whom Courtney's voice just represented. Waiting. First at the cross, powerless to stop what was coming, but not powerless, to be sure. Then at the tomb, thinking back on the life they had with Jesus in Galilee, remembering all the joy and the hope the heartache and tears and pain that with him were transformed into new life. They knew personally the power of Jesus' way, and they had big plans for their families and communities, plans for their students and their patients, their clients and customers, their friends and kids and partners. They were making big plans for themselves. And in one short, terrible week, all that changed. What would happen to those plans? Who knew? For now, there was only that one thing left to do. They would stand at the cross and wait. They would sit by the tomb and wait. Traditionally, the church calls this waiting Holy Saturday, you know, the day between Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning when the shadows spread across the face of the earth, when the valley of the shadow of death descends to its lowest, when that flame keeping the vigil is all but snuffed out. As Batman says, and probably some other famous preachers too, the night is darkest just before the dawn. All of us have some experience with waiting. Many of us have waited while we heal from an injury or an illness. Over these last years, I've had the privilege of accompanying some of you through the death of loved ones. In each person's life and death is different. 
expected or shocking, relieving or devastating. But one thing they all share in common is that there is always some kind of vigil, a period of heightened presence while we wait and tend and reflect during or after the dying, while we make plans for the body, while we collect the memories. This work of waiting is always exhausting and it is always holy. Because this kind of, of waiting time is thin time. Waiting is thin time. The time when the space between earth and heaven, between human and divine, shrinks to nearly nothing. Those barriers that separate us fall away. The truth of the limits of our power, of our mortality, is laid bare. Thin time is profound because we can feel just how interconnected everything is. So a map of the world shows the spread of a virus around the globe, millions of lines woven here and densely packed there. But that same map with a different title could just as well be a cartographer's view on human connection. Laughter and tears, hugs, heartache, anger and love, words shouted and sung, touches of joy and bouts of despair, all spread along those lines through human contact, through the very relationships that make and keep us alive. In thin time, the veil that separates a blessing from a curse is all but torn down and we're left waiting, holding the pieces. How can it be that what makes us so very human is also what makes us so very fragile, so very exposed? We are living through a thin time. Thin time is unsettling, it's disquieting, it's unnerving. Thin time is terrifying because our, vulnerabil our vulnerabilities are laid bare. In a time of crisis, to quote Pope Francis, we see the false and superfluous certainties around which we have constructed our daily schedules, our projects, our habits and priorities. We see how we have allowed to become dull and feeble the very things that nourish, sustain and strengthen our lives and our communities. Thin time shows us ourselves and our society under a microscope. The torture and execution of Jesus is an event that ushers in thin time. The earth shakes, the cosmos dims, the veil between holy and human shatters, and we are left to ponder at the pieces. Those who expose Jesus' body to pain and death also mock him for his supposed lack of power. Save yourself, they shout. If you are God's child, come down from the cross. He saved others, they cry, testifying to the healing that they had seen him do. Yet he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel, they accuse. Then let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, they acknowledge. Then let God deliver him now. Now, on my time, in my way. Those who expose and mock Jesus are incapable of seeing the power of God in anything other than Jesus coming down from the cross. Their only measure of victory is miraculous escape from the struggle. And like them, we have looked for God's victory in all the wrong places. We have trusted our welfare to the false gods of the market for too long, believing that some collateral damage is worth our prosperity. We have received our comfort through the devastations of war and the pillage of the poor and the planet. Lord, have mercy. We've mistaken security for peace and confused incarceration with justice. We've had too much faith in ourselves and not enough faith in our neighbor. Not enough faith in the God who at the last word chooses to be seen lifted up not on a throne, but on a cross. 
God who in the final analysis wants to be known as your neighbor, as the brown Palestinian man from Galilee who is betrayed by his friends, deplored by the church, suspected, profiled, and violated by the state, Not enough faith in the God who, when it is finished, does not lift Jesus off the cross and wield him like a sword to vanquish his foes, but shows up in the unlikely faith of a Roman soldier. Surely this man is God's son, he says. God who shows up in the powerful presence of the faithful, grieving women and in the tender generosity of the rich Joseph who activates his privilege to give Jesus his tomb. None of these unexpected heroes and sheroes had the power to save Jesus, at least not in the sense of interrupting his execution. None of them is Robin Hood showing up to little John's lynching with a bow and arrow and perfect aim. Not even Jesus plays this role. Not even God plays this role. That's not how real life lynchings end. True liberation is not miraculous escape. Neither is it simply leaving the fact of salvation to some future time or some otherworldly place. True liberation, God's good news for the world, is, in the gospel's telling, a simple, unadorned, loving presence. In fact, presence is the underlying theme of this whole narrative episode, from the disciples whose presence is absent to the women who are present to God, who seems not present at all. In desperate pain, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The greatest hour, or the hour, excuse me, the hour of his greatest need, does God really leave Jesus? Did the maker of all the universe just up and walk out of the room, exit stage right? There's a paradox here that's at the core of everything that matters most in the world. God is, to be sure, altogether absent from such atrocity. That human beings would execute this kind of terror against one another, that we persist in doing it at the unapologetic behest of our supposedly finest governments, that such a thing is deemed legal and necessary for power to violate life in any way at all, let alone the kind of grotesque violence deliberately displayed for the maintenance of power and the suppression of human dignity, this is, un, uh, excuse me, this is evil and anti-God. God is nowhere to be found in the wicked perpetration of torture and execution. And yet, this is the other side of the paradox. It is precisely at this moment of total divine absence that God is most fully present in the world. This is why Jürgen Moltmann titled his most famous theological work, The Crucified God. As one writer puts it, the power and presence of God is most dramatically operative at the point where human imagination assumes its absence in the brutal death of an unrescued Jesus. Wherever God seems not to be, that is where God chooses to be. Theologians variously call this solidarity, compassion, incarnation. Activists just call it showing up. Jesus said, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the power of presence, human and heavenly, holy and helpless, 
thin time, waiting time, vigil and vigilant time demands presence. Matthew says there were many women there that day. He also says they were present at a distance, which seems especially relevant at this moment. Unlike the other disciples, they did not abandon Jesus out of fear of the authorities or out of fear of their own grief. Instead, they remained present. They are there to tell the truth of that grief with their waiting bodies. As the door of the tomb rolled shut, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting the long Holy Saturday vigil, remembering the one whom they loved. They were angry, sorrowful, grieving. Maybe these courageous women show us something about the power of presence during such a time as this. Some of us, of course, do show up physically, and I'm thinking especially of the FMC healthcare workers and essential employees of grocery stores, hardware stores, and sanitation services. But like the women of the cross, most of us are called to be present for our neighbors by keeping our distance. We're all sheltered in place during a thin time, uncertain about what comes next. There's grief about what is lost and dying. There is fear about how long it will take. Our work is to wait, to sit vigil, to show up for each other precisely in our absence. For a time, for this thin time, we are a holy Saturday people. Because what if this time of waiting is our incubation period? What if our homes are not prisons of quarantine, but prisms of light that show a new commitment to being present with and for our neighbors? To paraphrase the Sikh activist Valerie Kaur, what if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if the story is not dead, but still waiting to be born? What if ours is the story of one long labor? What if, says Valerie Kaur, our shelter in place angst is our great contraction before we birth a new future? And so she says, remember the wisdom of the midwife. Breathe, says the midwife. And then push. Now it is time to breathe. Soon it shall be time to push. Amen. May it be so. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you Oh, 
sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Begin now our sharing, time for sharing and prayer. And I have a um, number of things that I'll share here. If you have something that you would like to share, you can, um, you can send it in via the Zoom chat. If you're tuned in on Zoom, you're welcome to text it to me right now. Um, there's a slight delay, so I'll, I should get it before we finish uh, the sharing time. Or you can uh, raise your hand in the Zoom platform and um, Barack can find you and unmute you. Um, I'll begin with what, uh, what I have here. First, a prayer request from um, Rachel Horse Lehman for the family of uh, her cousin, Caleb. Caleb's wife, Rachel, has been slowly dying from cancer since they returned from service in Cambodia some time ago. And uh, Rachel, about 30 years old, died yesterday after transitioning to hospice care earlier in the week. So we pray for Caleb and their two very young daughters as they grieve the loss of wife and mom. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. A prayer for uh, Karen Bidner, who's at Carl Hospital now after her elbow surgery. She'll probably be there until Monday. Um, she's feeling quite lonely as there are no visitors allowed. Um, and we do have a phone number for her if you'd like that. Um, contact Pastor Deb or me and we have permission to give that out. She would uh, very much like phone calls. She's in two large casts, one on her, um, her arm or elbow and the other down on her ankle and foot. Plans are for her to be in a short-term rehab facility as she recuperates from these major surgeries. Uh, please pray for her and those giving her care as she continues a difficult recovery. We pray for Karen. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Um, reports on Friday were that Evelyn's great-granddaughter had a successful double lung transplant surgery and was doing well, though in a lot of pain. And so we uh, are asked to please pray for uh, her body's acceptance of these lungs and for this uh, long healing that she has ahead of her. We give thanks for the successful surgery. Pray for her body. In your mercy, Lord, Hear our prayer. I received a note uh, this week from Danny and Barb, uh, who may be tuning in right now, I don't know. Um, they're in Vienna, Austria. Danny says, in case anyone is wondering, we're fine. They've been in uh, Vienna since March 12th, after two months touring each of the Balkan countries. Um, they considered returning home, but decided to settle down in uh, Vienna for the time being, which I learned is also the, um, the origin in the 1850s-ish of the wisdom about hand washing for preventing infectious disease. So they're in uh, uh, the epicenter of some good wisdom. Danny says, nearly everything is closed up, but we have access to excellent food, bread and pastries, allowed to go for walks, for exercise, and there are many beautiful parks. We still intend to be back in Champaign-Urbana by July. So keep them in your prayers and we give thanks that they're doing well. In your goodness, Lord, hear our prayer. Um, another uh, prayer of gratitude for Tom and Kathy who uh, made some rounds just a couple days ago delivering Sunday school kits and materials to uh, a number of the households of families in uh, FMC. We give thanks for them and um, they're making connection. In your goodness, Lord, hear our prayer. From Michelle uh, and Rudy. Um, our nephew, uh, Declan, Rudy's sister's uh, three-month-old, 
is scheduled to have surgery on his vocal cords on Friday. This will hopefully help him have more energy and eat more so that he will gain weight. He is currently around the fifth percentile for weight. Let's pray for a little Declan. For calm for him and his parents and family. For swift and successful surgery. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. I'm mindful that as we continue to do the sharing time like this uh, via live stream in a way that's also recorded and posted rather permanently to the uh, interwebs, there may be things that you would rather us not share um, in the public sharing time, but would also what might like to be in, to include on the prayer list. So please, when you're sharing uh, prayer requests, if that's a request, you're welcome to always send things to Deb and me throughout the week. The prayer list notes go out on typically on Tuesday afternoon. So try to get um, items to us by then if you can. Um, and if there's something you'd like shared uh, via the, the streaming service, but maybe want to eliminate names or eliminate last names, um, please let us know about that. It's a little bit of a sensitivity that we haven't always needed to be as concerned about when we're together in the same space. In the beginning, O oh God, you shaped my soul and set its weave. You formed my body and gave it breath. Renew us this day in the image of your love. O oh great God, grant us your light. O oh great God, grant us your grace. O oh great God, grant us just this day and let us be made whole in the well of your health. In Christ's name we pray, amen. last week, we still have a lot going on. We just do it remotely. Uh, so a reminder that there are chat groups on Wednesday at 8.30 and at 10. If you're interested in joining, uh, let uh, Pastor Michael or I know, and we will include you on the information. Also, the Thursday Bible studies are continuing remotely, and there will be a Thursday spiritual direction group uh, remotely. Um, the retreat committee met yesterday and provided that we are all back together again. The retreat is set for September 4th through 6th. So mark your calendars and there'll be more information about that. Hopefully you saw this week the, uh, the new weekly Evine that's, uh, we're planning to send that out on Thursdays just as an extra way of keeping in touch and highlighting um, unique community needs and some uh, simple moments uh, for us uh, in FMC these next weeks and months. So uh, if you haven't found that in your inbox and you are a subscriber to our regular email list, you might check in your spam folder or one of the other millions of folders that Google automatically creates for you. Um, do watch that. If you have ideas or suggestions for it, uh, reach out and let us know. Um, just a note that Holy Week is coming up. Uh, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and then um, 
towards the end of the following week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. There will be some special announcements about how we're going to do some of those services. Um, and so uh, some of it will be streamed, some of it won't. Uh, just watch your announcements for that. We'll, we'll begin to um, give some more details about that this week in announcements. And um, for Palm Sunday next Sunday, uh, our, our uh, palms had been ordered months ago. So we're expecting those to still arrive at the church this week. And Pastor Deb uh, and I are planning to deliver those at least to some households. We can't promise everyone. We're going to prioritize homes that have uh, kids in them. We're going to deliver them. We'll just leave them on, on your porch and you'll have some palms. And so um, watch for an invitation this week. Uh, we'll be thinking about how to actually maybe record some folks waving those palms and show that during the service next week. Um, again, we're just doing this one week at a time. So bear with us and watch for announcements. But uh, you may see some palms on your doorstep this week. Don't be surprised about that. Uh, save them, put them in a little water, and uh, bring them to worship with you next Sunday. Anything else? More announcements. We will have a uh, young adult meeting tonight at 7. If you did not get the invitation to that, let me know. Healer of our every Light of Ishamara, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. You who know our fears and sadness, grace us with your peace and gladness, spirit of all comfort, fill us. Healer of our every light of Ishamara, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. In the pain and joy beholding how your grace is Give us all your vision, God of love, healer of our every light of Ishamara. Give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. To love each other, every sister, every brother, spirit of all kindness, be our guide. Healer of our every light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear. And hope beyond our sorrow. You who know each thought and feeling, teach us all your way of healing, spirit of compassion, fill each heart. Healer of our every light of peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. Two quick things I forgot to mention. At 11 o'clock this morning on this same Zoom feed, join Chuck Gibson for the Prophets and the Justice and the Prophets Sunday School class. It's 11 o'clock this morning and I believe at 11.30 the youth have a uh, call scheduled as a Zoom call scheduled as well, and you should have the information for that. Hear these words of blessing Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ above us, Christ beneath us. 
We on your path, O oh God, you, O oh God, on our way, in the twistings of the road, in the currents of the river, be with us by day, be with us by night, be with us always. Amen. Go in peace.